Hey folks, Joseph Sabora here. And yeah, you just noticed the background has changed a bit <laughs> because I just got a new shelf from IKEA, so I just put in some new boxes or perhaps one of my old boxes of stuff to stick right into it so that way, you know, I have more space. And I just move in the the shelf uh, for all these clothes around so that way we have uh, plenty of space in my room. <laughs> so, of course, because I have to move a lot of things here and there, but everything particularly remains the same. Well, anyway, well, I just finished reviewing the first four Karate Kid movies by far ever since I got the DVD at Dollar Tree. The first movie from 1984, the original classic that started it all with Ralph Macchio and Nobuyuki Pat Morita as Daniel San and Mr. Miyagi. And it's simply the best, no doubt about it. And then we have part two, which in my opinion, as well as everyone else's, it's the only good sequel of the franchise and it's also the best sequel ever made, period. Yeah. Then we have part three, which is the weakest of the franchise, and I know everyone would agree, <laughs> also the worst at times. The only saving grace, however, is um, this, the scene stealing the villainous role of Terry Silver, played by Thomas Ian Griffin in his film debut. Yeah. And then, and then finally, the fourth and final chapter which is indeed the worst but like the third film they both have their merits uh, but this was the last time we get to see uh, Pat Morita reprise his role as Mr. Miyagi because after that he went on to do several roles until his death sadly but this was of course um, a breakthrough performance of Hilary Swank I mean this was long before she went on to win two Oscars for her performances in films like Boys Don't Cry and uh, Million Dollar Baby which eventually was a lot similar to The Next Karate Kid. <laughs> of course uh, I don't have The Next Karate Kid on DVD but I guess if I thought about it maybe I will pick it up or on oh maybe on Blu-ray I don't know but that doesn't make it a good movie yet alone good sequel that's for sure or whatever but now comes the 2010 remake of the karate kid this time with jaden smith the son of will smith and jada pickett smith who are the film producers behind the uh, overbrook entertainments and jackie chan an international superstar and legendary actor, producer, writer, director. Yeah, I think he directed movies. But he's also a professional stuntman himself. I mean, he's done a lot of incredible stunts and a lot of amazing martial arts. I mean, no doubt about it. So, uh, this time, while it's eventually the same plot as the original 1984 classic, this time they did several changes to make it quite different. Sets up as its own movie. Uh, instead of being New Jersey and California that they had to move, it's Michigan and China. And they also changed the names of the characters. It's not Daniel San and Mr. Miyagi, it's Dre Parker and Mr. Han. And plus, there's characters like um, Mel Jean and Chain and Sherry, which is the mother of Dre, and all the rest. Plus, you get to see exotic locations and some new um, stories to tell. Like, they added it all into it. But at the same time, which I... I know it's going to be hard for me to review this movie. It really is. 
I'm gonna say this. That's where I was really afraid of when when I heard that they were gonna do the remake of this. Now I I know I've done my research here because actually the the title the Kung Fu Kid that was gonna be the original title that Jackie Chan suggested to the filmmakers. Apparently it was known as the Kung Fu Dream. And that's the name that's that's actually called in China. So apparently I could have just called it the Kung Fu Dream instead, but I still like to be referred to as the Kung Fu Kid because it makes more sense. Yeah. Because it's not karate, alright? It's Kung Fu. The movie's supposed to be Kung Fu, but Sony in their particular ways just wanted to use the title because of producer uh, Jerry Weinstripe when he was alive. I mean, because he was a longtime producer of the Karate Kid films. And he produced this film as well, joining in with other producers. And they got Harold Swart, the same director who has gave him some bad films in his career. You know, he's the man responsible for films like One Night in Bakul's as well as Agent Cody Banks, the Pink Panther sequel, yep, with uh, Steve Martin, which is the remake uh, of the sequel, whatever. And even a movie called The Mortal Instruments City of Bones. Yeah, the one with Lily Collins from Mirror Mirror. Yeah, the daughter of Phil Collins. Yeah, so he's not much of a good director, but I guess he only had a few films that were pretty, uh, which I haven't seen, but I think it's pretty hit the mark right there. But, um, but they got writer Christopher Murphy, um, who went on to do the TV series Body of Proof um, that was on ABC, which stars Dana Delaney as a medical examinator. Uh, so I think this is one of his, um, might be his first writing job. I, I don't know. Back to this, um, I had a bit of mixed feelings about this film because at first, specifically with Jaden Smith, I mean, his first role was indeed The Pursuit of Happiness um, with Will Smith, which I did like the movie, by the way. It's uh, It's a great drama. But I had a problem with him in that one remake that he did called um, The Day the Earth Stood Still, the one with uh, Keanu Reeves and Jennifer Connelly, um, along with Cal Chandler, uh, Kathy Bates, uh, James Hahn, John Cleese, all come to mind. And I thought he was incredibly annoying, irritating in that movie. And that's what I was afraid of when I saw him in this one. Besides um, The Pursuit of Happiness, as opposed to this movie, I haven't seen a good film that that I really praise his performance in. And that's my problem. Because he was really bad in After Earth with Will Smith. That was directed by M. Night Shyamalan. Yeah, that was definitely a terrible movie, and I, I was very shocked about that. And he was also in the movie called, yes, because the song is featured in this remake, Never Say Never with Justin Bieber. And I hate Justin Bieber. I know, I thought he was cute at first, but it turns out he's just basically another Timberlake. As if he wasn't bad enough as it is, or even a mixture of vanilla ice in there. Ugh, I'm tired of these pop stars. It's like we're, we've been getting some really no talent pop stars every year, you know? That's what bothers me so much. And then, and here's another thing it's unnecessary. We didn't really need a remake of the 1984 film. We already know the story, okay? Ralph Macchio, yeah, he was an adult, but he still looks like a young kid at heart. He looks like a kid. I mean, 
he's basically a teenager, so it makes sense. I mean, it was common in the 80s and even to today, you know. They, they cast 20-year-olds uh, uh, to play teenagers. So what was the big deal? I mean, did they really wanted it to change all this stuff just so we can have um, a kid play the role? So that way the title makes more sense? I mean, seriously. That, that's my problem. And that's another problem I also have is that I was afraid that, you know, Jackie Chan's going to top uh, Pat Morita's performance, even though he, he's getting there, though. But, I mean, it's hard because I, I love Jackie Chan and I love Pat Morita. But, hey, you know, we did have a movie called, uh, <laughs> that Pat Morita did that's very in vain with uh, Rush Hour called Collision Course, so I, I guess we can see the similarities here. <laughs> so I guess why not? Um, and I know Jackie Chan just did a movie called Spy Next Door that same year, and that was really bad. And I, I admit it, it was pretty bad. <laughs> but it did have its funny moments, I'll, I'll give you that, but it's still stupid. Um, but they also got Tar J.P. Henson, um, who's been in a lot of uh, movies that I could think of, like some comedies and dramas. And she's a great actress, um, come to mind. I kind of like her... Um, her spunkyish uh, too, and as uh, as a uh, Dre Parker's mother, uh, Sherry. So she she's um, very good in this. So I'm, again, I'm going to talk about that again. <laughs> but anyway, um, I I mean, it got a lot of praise when it came out. I mean, I was surprised it, it got a critical praise from everyone. It got a 66 percent on Rotten Tomatoes, which that felt pretty damning because the second one of the Karate Kid film gets a 42%, which just doesn't make any sense to me. And that's what I was afraid of, too. Like, geez, I mean, and well, another thing that I was afraid of is that people are going to say that they love the remake better than the original. And I'm like, come on, people. I mean, geez, I mean, have respect to the original, because this is where it all started, okay? <laughs> it's the movie that exists. It's the idea. It's a story about, you know, an underdog, you know, trying to defend himself against these bullies. And, and you have um, a master who's, who's like a surrogate father to him. It, it's the true meaning of, of friendship and relationships that will definitely... You know, have his mind focus, his confidence, his strength. He'll be able to rebuild his kindness so he won't end up being what he is. Like a wimp. Like he'll be stronger this time. Like he'll be able to know everyone better. He'll be able to have his love ventures better. And he'll be able to uh, f fight on the tournament as far as I'm concerned. So that's the purpose. So, yeah. So... Okay, so that's what I was afraid of too. But nevertheless, you know, this film definitely pays its respect. At least it did. But it does have issues, and that's what I'm going to get to when I review the film. Because this time it's it's a story about, you know, a 12-year-old um, from Detroit who just moves to Beijing, China with his mother. Who who getting is getting picked on by the neighborhood bullies, which the leader is Chain. Which then that's where he meets uh, Mr. Han, who's the handyman of the apartment that they're living in. And together, you know, they're about to train, getting ready for the tournament. So there you go. And plus, he has a love interest, who's a violin a violinist. You know, getting ready for her performance, hoping to get better before they start hanging around. You know, that sort of, so. Plus you get a lot of, uh, some other training skills here and there that's impressive. But anyway. So let's start the review. Stars Jaden Smith, uh, Jackie Chan, Tar J.P. Henson, 
Wing Wen Han, Zeng Wen Wan, Yu uh, Wang Guan, Luke Carberry, Xinya Lu, Ji Wan, Senzu Wan, uh, Senzu Wu, sorry, Shane uh, Wan, Yi Zio, Karen Hillman, Bozan, and Guan Samuel Brown. Um, it's written by Christopher Murphy, which is based on the characters by Robert Mark Common, and it's directed by Harold Swart. The movie begins where we meet a trivial boy named Dre Parker, played by Jaden Smith, who joins in with his mother, Sherry, played by Tar J. P. Henson. They just moved from Detroit, Michigan to Beijing, China, because um, she just got a new job that's being transferred to her car factory that she works. And they just found a new apartment, which is being run by a maintenance man named Mr. Han, played by Jackie Chan. Yeah, when she goes around, you know, using the chopsticks um, to catch the fly, and then he uses a fly swrapper. Yeah, trying to do a nod to the original classic. Because, <laughs> um, you know, Mr. Miyagi was trying to capture the, the fly through his chopsticks. <laughs> yeah, and he tries so hard to capture it. Uh, anyway, Dre decided to go with uh, the neighborhood kid next door to hang around at a nearby park where he goes around playing basketball with, with his buddies and then later he went on to play ping pong with some old folks till all of a sudden he eyes on a young violinist named Mel Ying who's played by Win Win Han um, so it was like actually like love at first sight just giving his attention here Till suddenly, a boy named Chain, who's played by Zeng Wei Wan, he's uh, a rebellious kung fu prodigy, joins in with the rest of his gang, using all these kung fu skills and, and beats the crap out of him to make matters worse, because, yes, he's going around, you know, taking the, the, sh the sheet of music and just froze it on the ground and what's worse is that his family is closer to uh, Mayans just keeping them apart so it physically attacks them as, as it continues because to make matters worse they started physically attacking him at school you know started to make fun of started um, knocking his uh, cafeteria tray around he just couldn't stand it. Um, he just can't stand getting bullied. And of course, he did try to fool um, Sherry by putting some makeup to cover the, the, the black guy that he had. They got beaten up at school. Kind of like um, in the original when Daniel Son actually had to use some shades to cover the, the black guy that he had through his mom. Um, and so that way they, you know, he pretends like he's not in a fight or anything. They went on a field trip to the Forbidden City, so they get to um, look at all the sites and uh, some exotic locations around. And then next thing you know, uh, Dre would later throw a bucket of dirty water at Chain and the rest of the gang, and they were chasing him around and was ready to attack him until suddenly Mr. Han appears and started to attack them you know, using his Kung Fu skills his martial arts Han defeats them in close combat knowing that he is indeed the master of Kung Fu and showing himself to be the Kung Fu master alone so then Han actually heals uh, Dre's injuries by using a fire cupping you know, kinda like what uh, Mr. Miyagi did too when he heals uh, Daniel Sons' wounds. He tells that those students were incredibly bad and he found out who the teacher was and he's the one that runs um, a dojo, yeah, a kung fu class somewhere that uh, he spotted um, in the Forbidden City. 
he was pretty interested at first, but he wasn't so sure. So at, at this rate, um, Han decided to take uh, Dre to the class and actually have them challenge uh, for a tournament. So that way he'll be able to per he'll be able to train for Kung Fu if if Chain and his gang stop bullying him. So that way they'll be ready for it. So perhaps at this rate, um, yeah, because they did use the the quotes from the original, you know, mercy for the weak, if you think about that, yeah, no guts, no gory, no mercy, whatever, yeah, and I forgot about that line too, mercy for the weak, <laughs> that uh, <laughs> Koba Kai had used, so, of course, the idea of this was that if Dre doesn't show up along with Han, then yes, I mean, he's going to get killed, beat up, for the rest of his life. So Han's promise was to teach uh, Dre Kung Fu by, get this, uh, using the jacket, sort of a take on wax on, wax off, but it's the technique for for putting the jacket on and jacket off. Just put it on the hanger and do it several times until he finally gets it. And that's like the only training that he got to do instead of doing the actual chores that I was expecting to do. And I gotta be honest, that was pretty lame, but whatever. That's all they had to do because I guess he can't do any wax on, wax off and all these cars. But there wasn't that many cars, it's only one in the parking garage. Although I guess it was pretty funny too because... Uh, uh, I like that moment when uh, Sherry came by, you know, dressing up because they're being invited to the festival. She got tickets for it. You know, they were about to watch like a like a puppet show that they got, and you know, they're about to eat some food and explore around that sort of thing. And plus, Dre got to uh, go with uh, Mei Yin to hang around while watching the performance. And it was very nice, too, to see the puppets, uh, which is the story about the prince and the princes and all that. She did say, Dre, pick that jacket up. <laughs> yeah, because uh, Dre's always been leaving the jacket on the floor. Um, whenever he comes home and he just turns on the TV watching SpongeBob SquarePants in Mandarin. <laughs> Okay, um, but yeah, the festival that they went to, uh, yeah, they went to a festival, and they share a kiss. Um, the play that they were watching was The Cowherd and the Wetter Girl. That, that's what it was called. Um, so that's where Dre and Megan's uh, friendship came completely close. Which then Dre persuaded her to cut school for a while because, you know, just to... Because he found out that that uh, Mei Yin actually has a break, so she has to go um, the following day. But then, then he realized that just because she received a phone call while they're just going around hanging around uh, playing video games such as the Dancing Revolution, which he actually hear a song by Lady Gaga, a Poker Face, and some rap song that they play, hip hop. Um, we did learn that Mei Yin actually had uh, a violinist uh, performance that she has to practice, um, which happened to be on the same day. Um, so they changed plans. So she has to go over there with her parents so she could perform. Yeah, she had to keep practicing, even though the instructor was like giving her some mixed uh, feelings and thinking that she, she's not very good at it. but. But according to Dre, he thought that she was great, excellent, so at least she's trying. Um, so during that particular day, just when she was about to do her performance, um, and during the uh, audition, that uh, Dre did came and he applauded, but then suddenly her parents uh, told her that she's not going to see uh, Dre anymore because it's going to lead to problems. 
So throughout um, the entire um, weeks before the tournament begins, he starts practicing. Um, but then next thing you know, um, Mr. Hahn took um, Dre all the way to the Tawas Temple into the Wudan Mountains. Because that's where we spot a, a snake lady. Which that's where uh, Han explains to, to Dre that the lady is not copying the snake. The snake is copying her. I mean, that's what we thought. Yeah, they had to climb all the way up on the stairs. Um, I mean, they took a train to get there. And they actually got some water. You can see the, the water fountain that has um, a yin-yang symbol on there. And yeah, he drank the water. It, it tastes so good. And this is where he discovers, you know, where Han actually had visited when he was very young, about his age. And how he did his training. And this is how he's going to start continuing to go on. Even though he got tired of doing the, the jacket. And then that's where he starts to train even more. And, and finally he gets a day off. Um, which I know he had to go out with um, Mei Yin. And, and yeah I already explained it already. Which then leads to basically a sad moment where we found out that um, that Han and his wife along with his 10 year old son they were actually killed in a car crash yeah he was drunk and he started smashing his car um, and it happened on June 8th that I, what happened was though was that he was arguing with his wife over something that he doesn't know about and he felt bad because because he was responsible for the the car crash and uh, it was a very sad moment sort of like uh, like in the first movie where you know Mr. Miyagi was a soldier and he was talking about you know trying to celebrate the day that this happened knowing that uh, his wife and uh, her newborn child, um, yeah, she she died because of an illness. So they they wanted to make this more tragic in this version. Yeah, and Dre, you know, was in tears as well. They were both in tears. So now, um, after the training, we finally get into the tournaments where change joins in along with uh, the rest of the the Kung Fu game and that's where we have the biggest challenge of them all and it's just like the the tournaments in, in the movie <laughs> um, of course Chain definitely does get disqualified after that that hard hit that Trey got it went straight into his leg yeah swept the leg and they weren't so sure if Dre was going to get up and be able to fight because this was going to be it until, yes, Mr. Han did use the healing power for him so he'll be able to go on and be able to finally beat Chain and be able to win first place. The award. There you go. So the movie ends with that stupid song, uh... Never Say Never by Justin Bieber. Ugh. Okay, okay, I know that song sucks. Um, I guess it's going to be a tough way for me to react. Um, but I'll say this, though. I liked it, but I wouldn't say I love it as much as um, everyone else does. I just think it's... Um, for what it is, it's um, it's a decent remake, but it doesn't mean that it's the greatest film since sliced bread. I mean, this could never top uh, the first Karate Kid movie, no doubt. This could never top that. You can't do it, even if you try. I mean, I know it sets up its own ideas, but it's still the same story as you could tell. I mean, I know they had to do major changes here and there. Um, 
But I'll say this though, um, what made me like the movie is the performance of Jackie Chan because he was excellent as Mr. Han. I mean, like Pat Morita as Mr. Miyagi, I mean, he definitely is as eccentric, humble, and the kind of guy who you can trust and deal with. I mean, and I guess you could show the, the acumen of a friendship here with Dre Parker, even though it's very poignant in a way. Um, and even for that alone, um, I love the location of Beijing, the China, and it's great to see you know, the Forbidden City, the Great Wall of China, the temples, and and the the Wildane, the mountains. They're just spectacular. Um, and I give credit to uh, the filmmakers who had the the guts to actually shoot all these scenes in there because it's kind of hard to actually have access to shoot scenes like this if they have to be given permission to do so and this is probably one of the rarest times you get to see that I mean I know they had filmed these locations in some movies but that's the case you know but they must have had a hard time having to do this um and as as far as this concern, I mean, Jaden Smith, to me, I'm trying this hard to like him in the film, and I'm trying to. I mean, he's tolerable enough, but the way his attitude is just bothers me, and that that's the case here in the film. I mean, I don't know. He just he seems kind of miscast, in in my opinion. So I, I just didn't follow uh, the role that I was expecting. Plus, the film does get a bit bland at times, too. That there's scenes that just didn't quite work. Um, if you know what I'm talking about. I don't know, That that's just what I thought. I mean, specifically, uh, you know, Dre Parker, you know, Jaden Smith, I mean... He was pretty blandish. I mean, of course, given the style of, of his look, you know, that uh, <laughs> that red braid hair look that he was given, kind of starting to look almost like uh, Snoop Dogg, in a way, Yeah, when he was given that hairstyle. I just didn't like the training scene of, of the jacket. I think that was just uh, incredibly forced, kind of... And very lame, too. I mean, come on, man. I get that. He gets it. And the the, the film's uh, pacing is incredibly slow. Um, I don't, it, it does drag a bit here and there. Some, some scenes work. Other scenes don't. That's my problem. Like, I get it already I know how the film goes alright I'm not I'm not stupid um I do love uh, Tal J P Henson's performance as Sherry I mean she was very spunky I could definitely see that um because she's a great actress I like the love interest too um Wing Wayne Han's performance as Mei Yin she's very cute um, Chain um, is amazing too, played by Zing Wayne Wan, even though he is indeed a jerk. But I could definitely see how he portrays. Uh, Master Lee, uh, yeah, that's the guy who's uh, who owns the uh, who runs the the kung fu class. Uh, Yu uh, Wangan was also excellent. You could tell how tough this guy really is. He's sort of like uh, John Kreese, because that's what he's based on. So you could definitely see how tough this guy could be. Like He knows that he wants a chain to win. Um, the soundtrack, with the exception of songs like Back in Black by ACDC, because I love that song, Higher Ground, which is a remake of the Stevie Wonder song by Wet Hot Chili Peppers, of course, been heard in many movies. 
Um, and yet, I, I also love the song uh, Say by John Mayer, which was a song that was heard in The Bucket List with Jack Nicholson and Morgan Freeman. Uh, that's a good song. Um, and I even like the Poker Face by Lady Gaga and Gorillaz, um, Dirty Harry, yeah, which is sung in, in Chinese. Uh, I love that song too. Um, and I love the score that's done by uh, James Horner, so it's sort of like the score that's a mixture to um, to Bill Conti's uh, original score. So th there's a nod to that, but there's also a mixture of of the score that has a a, a Chinese feel to it, you know, Mandarin, and even the the violin audition scene that Mei Yin is doing. I mean, they did throw in a nice score too, and using you know Choplin's uh, Nocturne uh, Number Twenty sort of thing. Um, but the rest of the songs are crap. Everything from Justin Bieber to um, you know all to hip hop songs here and there that are just garbage to me. It just doesn't fit the tone for this movie and. And it sure hasn't. Um, it just doesn't work. Um, I also noticed that um, they were going to try to edit out some scenes in the China version. Where, yeah, they're going to censor the, the kissing scenes and, and the bullying scenes too. But I saw the North American version, so I know how that's reacted here. So it's it's basically banned over there in China. Um, and I just feel like, you know, I don't know, some of it just feels, you know, like I said already, I mean, it's it just feels way too forced. And it just bothers me a little bit. Um, so that's what I was afraid of, too, uh, when I saw the movie. Uh, the violence in the film is intense, you know, with the fight scenes, especially in the tournaments or even the bullying, as we saw, I mean, some slap faces and hits, you know, they kick him in the, the abs, you know, almost coughing up blood, yeah, there, there's a bit of blood in there, cuts and bruises. Um, but anyway, it was a big hit uh, when it came out in 2010. Um, out of its 40 million budget, it made 359 million dollars worldwide. Um, they were planning on doing a, a sequel, but that never happened. Although they've been in talks for that, so. but I don't know what's going to happen next. Um, so I, I guess in a way. I'll say this though. I mean, it's worth watching if you love the 1984 movie as well as the sequel, or you probably love all of them just for the sake of it, or especially if you're just a huge fan of the Karate Kid franchise. Um, but chances are, you know, you're gonna have some some mixed feelings, you know, because of the way the story goes or the way. You know the pacing is, and the way the way you know things are just happening. I don't know. Um, but other than that, though, it's it's what it is. It's a decent remake. I mean, at least it was paying respect to the original. So I mean, it, even if it's unnecessary, it's what we had to go for. And I'm I'm just at least to me, you know. I was worried, but in the end, I did enjoy it. I mean, I know I'm repeating myself, but it's worth it. That's all. So that's the Karate Kid 2010 remake, and I give the movie three stars. Yeah, I'm going to be fair. It's three stars, um, despite of its issues. I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and, well, 
I finally finished reviewing all the Karate Kid films. So now I can finally move on to what I'm really be doing. You know, maybe doing some more movie reviews of other films or or any other. <laughs> so that's finally it. And I'll see you later. Bye.